All right. Welcome, welcome, welcome back. All right. So now we're going to look at uh, EMS systems. All right. So one thing I just definitely wanted to make an announcement is you will hear a bell. Well, oh, maybe like that. There we go. That bell is to tell you that's very, very, very important. This is something that you'll always see in an exam on an EMS exam worldwide. It doesn't matter. It's There's tons and tons and thousands and thousands of exams out there. But this is like the typical basic stuff, okay? So that's one. Number two is I'm going to keep it very vanilla, which means I'm going to um, just make it as simple. Now, there are, I'm not focusing on one region or one specific state. I'm going to take this state by state, town, region, even global. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. So in that said, I'm just going to say to you, follow your local protocols, follow your local you know, procedures, based on your state. That's what I'm going to say if you don't, uh, if I don't give that. Because if I do that, and one thing I can say also is that medicine always changes. Medicine changes all the time. So if medicine changes, protocols changes. All right. So I might be recording this now and in like another five years, something totally different happens. So I'm just going to say, follow your local protocols and procedures of your state. All right. So let's begin. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. Get to work. All right. EMS systems. All right. We're going to look at the EMS systems, the intro to EMS. All right, here it is. So now we have a couple of things. I'm going to move myself here. Look at this. Wow, good. So you can see the pictures. So EMS system. So now we have a lot of different pictures here. So some great pictures on the very top right. If you see here, this is a, an ambulance, right? So this ambulance here is either loading or unloading a patient out. All right, they have transport units. They also have 911 units. So they might be either loading. But whatever it is, there is people working to help this patient. When we go down to here, we find that there is an ambulance and with some lights and sirens probably you can hear. Well, you can't hear it now, but there's some lights going on. They're either responding to a call or heading to the hospital. Here, I took this picture of a nice fire truck. All right, so this fire truck is also part of the, the system. And here we have another fire truck here with a car that's upside down. So this is upside down really means it's going to roll over. All right, that'd be some terms. It depends on what part, what state you're from. They always have different terms, but sometimes there's some universal terms we have. So there's a rollover, all right, a, a motor vehicle accident. So here, so the EMS systems itself is a team. I say the word, team of healthcare professionals. So these are professionals. These are just not regular people, right? Not trained. We're professionals and we're here to help do what? To provide the emergency care whether a trauma patient, which is on the bottom left picture, or maybe a medical patient who probably is that last, that that right picture here. So either one of them is we're going to work as a team. And we're talking about who is part of this team that's going to be working because we can work with uh, EMR, with paramedics, with uh, BLS or EMTs, ALS as paramedics, AEMTs. Then we have the doctors and nurses. We're all working together to help provide care for these, this, these the patients that we come across. All right. So now, in order to do all that, we have to go through a state certification exam, all right, to be certified. All right. We just got to go through the steps. And we're going to go over some of what the steps are a little later. And as you do the course, once you pass these exams, finals, and so forth, CPR, then you're going to go into your New York's um, based on your regional protocol, state protocol, your state that you're going to be in, whatever state certification is, that's where you're going to be doing um, the written exam last and then your, your practical exam. So practical exam first, and then go right into the final, final, final to say that you are an a emergency medical technician, which is your written exam. Then if he decides, hey, you know what? I want to go move to a different state. I want to go somewhere totally different. I want to start afresh and I'm going to go and take my certification with me. Yes, you can. If you want to just go, I always uh, encourage people to keep moving forward, keep moving forward in your career. If you want to get a national registry of EMT exam, you can also take that as well. I have a number of my former students call me and say, hey, I'm moving to this state, that state. What do I do? And I always guide them into the right direction. So the National Registry is also another exam that you can take. And once you take it, you can take that to another state if you wish to do so. 
All right. All right. So there are four levels of training, four levels of training. So oh, here, let's go with this. Now, I personally uh, am I'm born and raised in New York City in the Bronx. It was pretty tough where I grew up. And one of the things I did as I was a preteen, I got into uh, amateur boxer and then got into martial arts, believe it or not. And I'm just saying this for a particular reason. So in martial arts, there are belts. I'm not talking about what particular martial arts, but there are some that have belt systems. And one of the basic fundamental belt, and maybe you can answer this, is which which is which one is the beginner belt? Yeah, tell me what you think it is. Exactly, right? The white belt. All right, so I'm just going to make up number uh, uh, colors, excuse me, colors. So within the color itself, is going to tell you the next level and the next level. So you may follow with me. So we're going to go with white belt. We're going to go with yellow belt. We're going to talk about brown belt. And we're going to talk about black belt. All right. So now let's switch over to medical medicine. So in the level of trainings, we're going to have the basic white belt. The white belt is a basic, basic support. All right. The life support, which is known as EMR. Okay. EMR is right here. Then if you want to move over to the yellow belt, the yellow belt, boom, it's going to go to the EMT. From the EMT, boom, we're going to go to the next level, which is the AEMT. And the next level after that, boom, is going to go to the paramedics. So there is levels in your training. So let's break it down real quickly. So here we have EMR. EMR are known as the responder, but they're first, the first responders. And typically, they might be pr uh, providing care before the ambulance gets to the scene. All right, so EMR, emergency medical responders, have the basic training. Now, who are they? It can be a lifeguard, it could be a firefighter, police officer, state ranger. It depends on where and if the classes are available. All right. You might come across these individuals wherever you are, and at least you know what they are. And that's the EMR. That's the first bottom level. That's the white belts. Now we're going to go to the yellow belts. The yellow belts will be considered the EMT, the emergency medical technician. I love these people, right? They're, they're me. I have done this for a number of years, two decades of this. And we are technicians. I'm going I'm to stress on this. Technicians are someone who fix things. If I have an issue with my car, my plumbing, my electricity, electricity, guess what? I'm going to call that technician. And that technician knows exactly what's going on. They can look at something, smell something, and hear something and know that what is exactly wrong, what's going on. They know what's wrong, and they're going to fix it. And as us, as an emergency medical technician, if this is something new for you, all right, you go into your school for the first time. This is, wow, uh, this is new to me. You're going to be one of us, all right? Emergency medical technician. So you're going to listen to stuff. You're going to hear stuff. You might smell stuff. You're like, wait a minute, something's wrong with this patient, and I'm going to treat it, all right, as a technician. That's who you are. All right, next is uh, with this EMT, you go through X amount of hours on the um, curriculum, and then you get more training and more equipment and, and knowledge as an EMT. So in the bottom here, we're going to have the automated external defibrillator. Here we got the pads. We'll talk about more than that later on. Then we have upper airways um, adjuncts, which is here. These are known as OPAs, oropharyngeal airways. Here we have NPAs, nasopharyngeal airway. You will definitely be very familiarized with this. Moving on to the next level, we set the yellow belts. We have the white belts, EMR, yellow belts, EMT, and AEMT, which is the next level. There it is. That next level here is AEMT's advanced EMT. They have IV or intravenous therapy, uh, limited to numbers of emergency medicine. Okay, so there's more training involved with this. As you notice in this picture, we have a thing called intubation. They've been intubated. All right. Here we have a setup for some IV. All right. So there are other types of um, advanced levels as an EMT. You can move on to that if you choose to do so. And depending on state and regions that provide this type of course. Last but not least is the black belts. The black belts here are the ones in which they have the highest medical authority. The highest medical authority. I'm gonna keep saying that. The highest medical authority. There's my bell, here it is. The higher medical authority, all right? These are the paramedics, all right? They're, they're to me, um, just like anyone else, they're well-respected and I depend on them whenever you need them in a pre-hospital setting. So endotracheal intubations, what they provide, they can also use, uh, they also use monitors, uh, cardiac monitors for those who have chest pains or cardiac issues, as well as a whole lot of medications and a whole lot of tools that they can use on the field. So those are the basic 
le high level of training. All right. Uh, as you notice here, it says a advanced life support, also known as ALS. ALS. Then we have EMTs going back to the yellow belts, as we said earlier. They are the BLS, basic life support. All right. Now we're going to get into the course. All right. I don't know how you found out about this EMT course is that you, wherever you are, you can take it at a school, a college, um, a, a volunteer ambulance corps, a municipal large city uh, training center. So whatever it is, we are going right into the course, but the three, the course itself has three, 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 three different major components here. The first one is called the cognitive. The cognitive is basically um, a classroom setting, as you see in the middle picture. Now, during COVID, it transitioned into a, eventually transit a lot of these virtual things, now more than ever. Then we have lectures, textbooks, right? Those are the real knowledge that we're going to put all of here, all of the different things we're learning in this knowledge. And once it's going in and going in and going in, now there's a, another portion of the training in the EMT school. It's called psychomotor. Psycho here, motor here which means you're going to be actually doing hands-on. So once you do these hands-on, then guess what? You're taking everything you're learning, and now you're applying it by moving, turning, doing this, doing that, putting this, putting that, doing compressions. Whatever it is that you are doing, this is something that's going to be very valuable to you. That's called a psychomotor. Now, whatever they are, depending, well, the schools that you're going to be going, this is a typical thing that they do. What they normally would do is they will demonstrate what is expect what is expected of you all right on a skill so you're going to demonstrate it any questions on the demonstration and then they'll put you into small um skill stations there all right depends on the amount of students you know but their skill stations and you're going to do the hands-on very important to do the hands-on and do something called muscle muscle memory over and over and over and over and over again all right i'm gonna teach you an ancient secret trick uh secret that's going to help you to get that to mastery level. All right. And watch one of my other videos on how to uh, present or what to expect in a skill, your first skill station. All right. And I'm speaking also to the new person who's coming to EMT school, the person who's been on for five years, 10 years, three years, 20 years, 25 years, 30 year EMT. All right. It's for all of us. All right. And last but not least, it's called effective. Effective is basically the this is when you put everything together. You take all the knowledge, you take all the hand, 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 hand uh, skills, and then now you're gonna say, why do I do this? What is the what is the reason behind a lot of these things? And scenarios plays that really good a component. All right, now state to state, there's some requirements. One of the requirements is high school diploma. Now, since you wanna drive an ambulance, right? Some people within the age that you are, you can have or have a valid driver's license, all right, to drive an ambulance. Proof of immunization, because again, we come in contact with a lot of different exposures and background check, making sure that you are the one in which going to be the one that's going to be um, uh, with your background. So if you have like a, a felony or a misdemeanor or anything like that, that goes through the chain and the process of the, the state that you're going to be lo um, located in which they make it, they go through their investigation, and then once they feel everything's good, they clear you to become uh, eventually at the end uh, an EMT. So every state by state has their own regulations, but they do a background check as well, and they, they look to see uh, where you are. Because remember, again, it's it's the safety for the public, for everyone, the patients and family, things like that. So they have to make sure those things are squared away. All right, let's go back way back into time of where they all develop in EMS, right? The history of it. So now it goes back to World War I, which they were volunteer, the voluntary ambulance service in the sense of them helping out people, soldiers, mainly in the battlefield dying. But they were given the basic life support, helping them out to survive. As the war continues in World War II, then it became the basic medical care. So they become a little more advanced as time goes forward. Now, there was a show I used to watch called MASH. MASH was the mobile army surgical hospitals. And I thought it was a fun show. It was a funny show. But I didn't realize it was a real deal thing in which um, they'll take soldiers wounded in the battlefield, put them into these, uh, to these helicopters, and then take them over to a mobile. It was a mobile surgical hospital. 
And this happened during the Korean War. And again, survival rate was high. All right, 1966. We're going to go to the 60s, the 70s, and 80s briefly here. Now, here it is. This is where it all started. It's, it's, it started off with something called the white paper. What does the white paper mean? That's a copy of it right there. All right, it is a accidental death and disability. What? What do you mean? This was the birth of EMS, all right? Neglected uh, diseases of modern society, EMS, uh, established EMS. So basically here was the birth. Now, what was it? It was, a, it was a good paper that was written and it was an awareness to show, like, listen, we need help because there were people dying in our roads from trauma, car accidents. People are dying, but yet in the military, the war zone, they were surviving because they had the basic care. So now this is where the pre-hospital care in the United States took place. This was like the birth of it. So what does that mean? Let's just break down the word pre-hospital and let's break down hospital setting or care. Hospital care, guess what? Where is that at? In the hospital. Pre-hospital care, where is that? Outside a hospital. And this is where we come into place. So this was the birth the time in the 60s of EMS. Now, when we go in and look into the 1970s, during the 70s, we have the United States Department of Transportation develop the first EMT national standard curriculum. Oh, wow. The Department of Transportation, the only thing about highways and stuff? Yeah, but most of the issues was happening in the highways. So it was a big concern. They brought it to, to higher ups in this country and they said, work on it, do it, let's get it done. And they brought the first emergency medical technician national standard curriculum. And this was it. This was the foundation during the early 70s of building this system that we have today. In the 90s and 80s, right, this is very, very simple here, we have advanced. So things start to advance as time went on, as usually things do. Then there's a comp uh, the organization called the American Heart Association got involved now, and now it started to provide the signs of cardiovascular. So guess what was ha also happening in the United States? Heart attacks, right? education, prevention. So they were bringing a lot of things. And even right now, you probably watch your television, you have something on, they call we call it the AHA, with commercials of awareness, teaching, educating. Moving forward to the 1990s, we had the National Registry of Emergency Medical Technician. All right, that is another push during the 90s of the national training curriculum. Not only the state now, but the national. All right, from the East Coast to the West Coast to the North to the South of the United States, this was a national thing, bringing it, pushing forward, pushing forward. Then the, the emergency medical agenda for the future, this was the guidelines for EMT training. This was developed by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This went all the way up to the top, and they took action and made things possible for what we do today. All right. So from the federal part of it, as we said earlier, they took action, and now there was a thing called the National EMS Scope of Practice Model, which means their specific setting of training that we do as EMTs, as EMRs, as AEMTs, and as paramedics. So there was a scope within itself, a model in which they had to provide that to there. As it continued to go for, forward from the federal part, it went down to the state part, which the law regulates specific um, EMS operations, okay? There are laws now, state laws. So every law, every state has specific laws within the operation of how things work with EMS. And the local levels, which is going further, further down within regions, is the medical director, which is AKA the doctor. All right, we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, so when we look at this picture, I'm moving myself down here. We have a defibrillator, all right, or an AED. And here, they, since there was a, a, a rise in um, heart attacks and cardiac arrest scenarios in, in, in the United States, they started to train now people or lay people 
to become BLS, the basic life support and CPR. So why is that? Why did I make that possible? Because again, there was only very few ambulances out there comparing to people. So the more people we train, the more people in case something does happen, they can take action while they call 911 and we get there. So another thing is the automated external defibrillator. We'll talk more about that a little later on in future videos. All right, now we're gonna go into the 14 components of EMS. Let's go. So public access, how does the public get access to the system? Simple, a phone, right? A phone, 911. And I'll talk about who they're gonna call, all right? Clinical care. And so within the scope of practice, uh, whatever uh, certification, EMR to C, uh, EMT to AEMT and paramedics, there is specific care within it, a scope and specific equipment also based on the training. The medical director is the doctor of one who oversees everything, making sure everything goes and runs smoothly. We're going to integrate the health services, um, pre-hospital providers uh, work with it. So we're going to integrate with nurses, doctors, specialists within the uh, facility of the healthcare system for the better of our patients. So this is has to work that way. You know, it has to work where I have to talk to the doctor, talk to the nurses, and provide this this kind of care that we're working together for the better of our patients. And last, well, not last, but last for the slide is information systems. Information systems are information of technology of the system because that's important to get as much information because they do all the diff different things, which we'll talk about the other components, which is data, research, corrections, things like that. All right, now we're going to have to do some prevention. So by preventing, excuse me. All right. I'm just going to move myself down here so you can see the picture. There it is. Prevention. So roles of EMS also plays a part in educating the people, educating the public, find ways that will prevent injuries and illnesses. All right, it's all about educating. So we get that information first. And as we move on to evidence-based medications, we're going to have to research. There's going to be a lot of research involved, finding the new sciences, all right? There's a lot of new things going on, new technologies that's going to help the better of the patient. Communication system. What do we call? 911, right? Call 911 takes you to a call. A caller who picks up the phone, receives a 911 call, and then depending on the region, depending on the state, then there are certain... Um, protocols within that or steps that goes in it to the dispatcher. Now the dispatcher receives the information, then dispatch is dispatch the actual ambulance unit to go to the call. Then in, I mean, okay, so we have a big system, but who, who, how are we going to hire these people? Well, the reason why, how we hired them is through human resources. Human resources is the one who goes through the, the process of hiring. All right. Registration and regulation. So there are different regulations within the, the, the federal level, state level, and local level. So there are different guidelines with that. All right. Evaluation. So we want to improve. Just like anything in this world, we want to improve things. So when we improve things, we need to get evaluations. And evaluations help the individuals to see, oh, I need to correct this or get improved in this area. Take a weakness to make it a strength. So we all they always make sure that there's quality improvement. At all times, best at his at, at his best. Then, in order to have this operation, you need to have some money. So there's fine uh, system financing, some funding, and public education is one of the key things. And education systems quality of that. So there's a, another component which is the educational part where you guys fall in there because you guys are under the umbrella of or you guys are under these instructors, the the instructor. So you're going to go into their educational system for the quality of that. So they're always improving in every part of the system. All right, now getting into, I'm moving all over the place. So we have the access, public access. So the public now has a situation, doesn't matter where it is, but it's outside the hospital. And now they have to get in contact with someone that's gonna help them. And doing that is calling 911. So 911 system now receives the information. It goes through a process, goes to the dispatcher, Okay. Now every area it's it's different as far as the system, but this is known as EMD. EMD known as the emergency medical dispatch. 
All right, so the medical emergency dispatch receives these information from the information, then they dispatch this information to specific units who are out there in the community and they get the call and they respond to the call. Zoop. There we go. <laughs> All right, this is number one. You need to, this is, I mean, everything else is important, but this is important because we need to understand who is this medical director. So in other words, medical director, AKA doctor. It is a physician, a doctor who oversees, what do they do? Oversees or authorize EMTs to provide medical care in the field. Very simple, authorize it. It also is a liaison. A liaison is someone who's the middle person. Or it, the doctor, the doctor is the middle person between two, between the hospital and the system, EMS system, the state, you know, so they're the ones that represents or the, the middle person of, of the EMS, EMS systems. Then they also have part in writing protocols. All right. Protocols come time to time and it changes. State by state, there might be a little difference. So wherever you are, you have to go based on your state protocols. And they are also standing orders. Orders that's, that comes up, new things, new equipment, new treatment, or added treatment, or a different way of giving the treatment. And it, it evolves over a period of time. So they give you also medical direction. So let's say you're on a call, you and I, who you're right there. You and I are on a call. I'm driving, you're teching. <laughs> you old joke. Right, and you're we're there, and you're assess the patient. A patient needs something, some some type of higher authority decision, or they want to go to a different hospital, or they want not to go to the hospital. So we have to call the medical director, and but we need to have a lot of information. This information has to be concise, ready to go on when we talk to the doctor, and whatever our case is or our situation, you don't always have to call the med medical director, but in case you do have those informations done first and they will give you the direction that you need to be in. All right. And moving Zach over here. Boom. All right. This, that is going to be number one. This is it. Medical control can be offline and online. So offline medical control or indirect control is the standing orders, the standing orders or protocols. So, Offline basically means you're not, it's the it's the written word, all right, which is a protocol, all right, or standing order is a written word that was written by a doctor, but you don't see the doctor. The doctor just wrote it, type it up. They wrote it up, edit it, and everything else. That is the standard, all right? So the offline medical control represents very easy, a protocol, a standing order. Things are, are written. Okay. Online medical control or direct medical control is when you're directly or you're online on the phone or on your radio talking to the doctor for advice. So know that that's important. All right. Rewind it, stop it, pause, rewind it again. I'm going to tell you right now, offline medical control is dealing with protocols and standing orders. Online medical control is dealing with talking directly to the doctor through a phone or through a radio, depending on what where you are. All right, evaluation. So we got, with this all have said, the medical director is responsible to maintain quality control. Quality, quality control, just maintain response, responsible for that. The, the, the CQI, which means the continuous quality improvement, just change up the words, improvement quality is always continually. We want to improve the quality at all times. And how do we do that? They do audits. They're not just doing audits just to be nosy. They want to do it to get the science. What do we do? How do we improve this? What, what way we can change this up? So it's always evolving. Then with that also, there is also refresher training, continuous education, the medical director will give updates, uh, new stuff approved by the doctor, 
and they're trying to minimize as much of the errors that's out there. Here's a picture I took over here in Queens, New York. We have a hospital. This is an ER bay. Uh, this is where our different, different ambulances all over park, and they take the patient right into this building to use emergency rooms. But there are different hospitals here. This is just three examples of many hospitals. There are different types. There's the, the 911 uh, receiving hospital. There is the stroke center. They can, there are trauma centers and replant centers. Which, what is a replant? It's basically an amputated part that was amputated and they need to replant it back together. So there's specific facilities for that or specialized um, facilities. All right. So those are just basic hospitals that we will have to take our patients. Now, the educational system, which is a system I've, I've, I've worked, I've worked in, and uh, they involve instructors. So these are EMTs or paramedics who are instructors, or EMR, advanced EMTs, depending on where you're located. And these EMT instructors have experience, all right? And they give their personal experience with the knowledge in more in-depth and provide that source. There are also different training programs all right, we already mentioned that there's an EMR program, there are EMT programs, we have AEMT programs, we have, so there are different courses that's provided for it. And if you want to get more in depth and to specialize, you can do hazmat courses. All right, and then there are also refreshers. We, you know, once they, this is all saying, it says, once you don't use it, you will lose it, you forget. So refreshers are great and they do it every so often, uh, typically every three years. And you go right into the next refresher class. I just finished mine a while back, so I'm good for another couple of years, and then I have to do it one more time. Maintain and updating information as well in that, and there's always some new stuff happening, new technology, new equipment. That's like, whoa, this is awesome, right? The days I used to work, we had uh, two-man stretchers where we, my partner and I had to lift up the patient, load him up into the ambulance, but now we have a, a little press the button, and you have the structures that go up and down and no lifting whatsoever. But yeah, these are the things that have changed and it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to change from 5, 10, 20 years from now. This is important. All right, there is my bell. And this is the roles and responsibilities as you as an EMT, as me as an EMT, or soon to be you as an EMT, soon to be EMT. Here it is. One thing you need to have if you're going to an emergency call, make sure you have fuel. <laughs> That's not a good thing, right? Make sure you have fuel. Check the equipment. Make sure the tires are good. You know, every, everyone has a specific... I'll go more in details at the very uh, last latter part of these presentations on operations. But equipment is very key to have. You cannot go to a call with no oxygen, no AED, no... You know, the, you have to make sure that's... And there's a, a, a guideline, which a checkoff list that you have to check to make sure you have all those equipment. And there's some ambulances right now that work 24 seven, which means um, it might be 12 hour shifts, eight hour shifts. But again, there's always someone that's gonna do a shift. So you don't know, there might be something missing. It might be one of those situations where they didn't restock. We'll talk about that later on. All right, seeing safety. It's gonna be a big one in the next couple of uh, videos where I'll talk about patient assessment, which means seeing safety, seeing safety, seeing safety, seeing safety. Making sure it's seeing safe for you, your partner and the community. All right, and your patient, myself, partner, patient, everyone, everyone, everyone gets to be safe. But make sure it's safe for you, and I'll go more in detail in the next couple of videos. Provide CPR, <laughs> right? Doing compressions. We'll go more in details on that. Additional resources. So we're gonna go. Yeah, sorry about that. We're gonna go right into resources. So we have an overturned vehicle upside down, right? Once this is there, your EMT, you can't open the door. Okay, so now we need to go into getting access, another source of resources. So you're going to have to call for specialized resources to help you along the way. And they have specialized equipment. We'll talk more about that a little later on in operations, gaining access. And gaining access not only in the vehicle, but also gaining access in someone's uh, apartment or someone else or some other area that we cannot get get access to the patient, we have to gain access to it. And if it's over, over our training, then we have to take it to the next um, level, which is calling additional resources to get that in there. Unless once we get to that access or not, then we have to do something, which is the core of this 
is to do patient assessment. So patient assessment is key. Emotional support. Now, people are calling, patients are calling, family members are calling us for the worst situation in their life. So we have to provide this type of emotional support to them. Your presence is there. Listening to them, right? So it just might just be your presence and just listening to them is, is the emotional support for them. All right. So do be professional when it comes to that. Legal. All right. We're going to talk about legal a little later on on the medical legal um, presentation. So medical legal itself, you know, that's there's a component behind it that we have to know and be responsible for that. And there might be some update stuff on legal. And think about this situation. I, I'm an EMT. You're my patient. I tell everyone your name. I tell everyone your social security. Number. I tell everyone your medical conditions and your medicines and stuff like that. Do you want that to happen? I don't think so. So the next thing is the HIPAA law or HIPAA Act, right? It's an act. And we'll talk about that at the last slide. And once you see that last slide, that means I'm done. Now, uh, when we help talk about also EMTs, the roles and responsibilities is transport your patient to the hospital, the appropriate hospital that's needed for that patient's care. All right, attributes, professional attributes. You want to be professional. Look at these guys. Their EMTs loading or unloading, not sure, based on that particular picture. But integrity is important. You're going to people's homes. You're going to you're getting access to places that other civilians don't get access to. All right. Having sympathy, empathy, being there at their worst. You can't understand. You understand. You you feel what they're going through. All right. So you have to show that being professional in these really critical, critical situations. In appearance, how you look, first impression is last impression. You can be the best EMT, but look like a slob. I don't know about that, but you can be the best EMT. But always keep be professional. You wear a uniform. So in other words, everyone is uniform one. All right. Everyone has a uniform to wear to look to the best. All right. You are represent you represent where you work or where you volunteer. And having self-confidence, self-confidence itself comes from experience, comes from experience. The more experience you have, the better of, of confidence you have. So keep that in mind when you do that. The more experience you have, the way I started, it was, I wasn't like the expert out there. I was learning, I was making mistakes, but I learned. And remember when you did, if you guys are on a job for a little bit, all right? But for you who are starting fresh, right? You're doing this for whatever the reasons. You're going to have to build the confidence. And the more you do it, and I, I will recommend just practicing those skills and the knowledge and looking through that. I'm going to have other record, uh, videos on how to study, how to memorize, and how to do all these other cool stuff that I was not taught. But it's based on my experience in, in the classroom. So I'm going to impart that knowledge to you. Also, communication. You're going to communicate with everybody, your partners, your boss, your supervisor, your first responders, other agencies, doctors, nurses. You know, you're going to have to learn form of communication. If you don't, then you will learn in this job. All right. You also have teamwork, working with it. There's a situation to the right-hand side, which is an overturned vehicle, and there are going to be more than more than one agency working on this. We're going to have EMS on scene. We're going to have firefighters. We might even have police officers to secure it. It might be a crime scene, which we'll talk about that a little later on. And you want to do, you always want to represent your patient. All right, patient advocacy, which is important for the best of the patient. All right, patient confidentiality. I told you, if you see this, this is the last slide. All right. Health Insurance Probability Accountability Act, which was established in 1996, and it was there to provide patient confidentiality. It doesn't always, always um, it does rely on, um, it does apply to us as EMS, but it also not only that, to other healthcare providers. That's what I wanted to say. All right, healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, specialists in the field, protecting the information of the patient. So this is the last conclusion of this presentation. I hope that you got something out of it. If you don't, re um, if I was moving, you can always pause it, stop it, rewind, and get anything valuable information there. So this is it. So welcome. 
And I'll have more videos coming forward in different topics. And my goal is to make you the best EMT in the world. All right. So have a good one. Be well, be safe, keep studying. Until then, we will see each other again. So again, share it, like it. Hey, let's do it. All right. So let's uh, get that done and continue to be the best person that you are and upgrade who you are. All right. Take care.